Hello, it's the 5th of June, 2015, and this is episode 9 of the Unseen Podcast. The Unseen Podcast is the unscripted, unedited, uncensored, open participation spinoff of The Wow Signal. To learn more about The Wow Signal, go to wowsignalpodcast.com. To learn more about the Unseen Podcast, go to unseenpodcast.com. This is our ninth uh, episode. We've got we've had just a total of just about 2,000 downloads so far. And so I think while the train hasn't pulled out of the station, it's, uh, it's starting to roll a little bit. And uh, we have with us tonight a, uh, two panelists, uh, one you've met before, um, James Garrison. Say hello, James. I'm back. <laughs> and uh, new to the Unseen podcast is Michael. Tell me if I get this right. Michael Cornett, right? You got it. Uh, Michael Cornett. Who is Michael Cornett? Michael Cornett. Uh, he works for a. Um, he, he works in registration for an agency that runs the examinations that dentists and dental hygienists have to pass in order to practice. So. Um, we're the people your dentist is afraid of, is the joke we make. And um, as a result, I've taken a lot of interest in dentistry and have learned a lot about some of the more interesting ins and outs of it and some of the woo-woo that's associated with it. All right. Now, I met you at uh, Drinking Skeptically once, didn't I? In, uh... I we probably did. Yeah, in, in, uh, in Silver Spring. Yeah, because um, I remember somebody there talking about give, having given a talk about woo-woo and dentistry. That okay. was me. Well, tonight, I'm on YouTube. tonight the uh, the topic is um, is skepticism and pseudoscience, and not the not the kind of obvious uh, woo woo that you run into, say, in uh, you know talking to the dead. Uh, although I understand you can talk to the dead, you just don't talk back. But um, the uh, you know ghosts. Um, alien abductions, chemtrails, that sort of thing, but rather more the sorts of things we run into in everyday life. Um, and James had a couple of good examples that sort of kicked this whole topic off in our thread on uh, Google Plus that we start about three weeks before we have each episode to discuss what topics we're going to go over. So I'm going to let James start with one or two of his favorites. Oh, oh, yeah, getting into favorites, that's a inter- interesting, <laughs> I've got a long list. Um, well, as I mentioned in the topics thread, I, I'm, you know, full disclosure, I'm the head of the Oklahoma Skeptic Society. And recently we had the co-founder of antipolygraph.org come in for a federal trial here in Oklahoma City. And he wanted, he offered himself to come and speak to us about polygraphs, which are, it's kind of interesting in that they're not allowed in trials as evidence because, you know, the legal system acknowledges that they're not reliable. They're completely subjective. You've got someone interpreting data however they want, kind of like a Rorschach test. Uh, But if you're going to get a federal job, which... I believe both of you have federal jobs. For a lot of them, you have to take a polygraph in order to, as part of the application process. Right. So, but yeah, he was just talking about how they were developed back in the uh, early part of the 20th century, and they really haven't changed a whole lot since then. So, but L. Ron Hubbard took part of it for his little e-meters. I know that much. Um, but yeah, they were, they thought that if they could measure, you know, the galvanic response, which is electricity passing through your skin, your uh, heart rate, and several other functions, they could use that to determine, you know, if you're telling the truth or if you're a liar. They seem to discount, you know, even if they do actually detect anything, they take they don't take into account that. Now, if you're nervous, your heart rate's going to change. Uh, just in order to get a baseline heart rate, you know, you need to take multiple measurements over multiple days because it's going to alter quite a bit. 
you can't just get hooked up to a machine and get an accurate uh and you know off of one data set you cannot get accurate results it's more or less used as a tool for intimidation right and i know you can't get certain classes of security clearance without it as well so it's a uh... It's it's an important part of of American life, the polygraph, and people will say, "Hey, I passed a lie detector test, therefore I'm telling the truth." Sometimes, which is <laughs> so we get both false positives and false negatives from that. It, yeah. But but it's very sciency, right? I mean, there, there's a strip chart recorder, there's devices, there's wires coming there, out of you, and there's a guy clucking at you as you're as, as he's asking questions. <laughs> Yeah, so there, there's – and it all seems very official and very sciencey, But the ba- the scientific basis for it is just – I mean, we don't really know – I think it's not that good, is it? I mean, that's why it's not allowed in, in court. Yeah, it's completely unreliable. Um, going to the website, antipolygraph.org, the National Academy of Sciences concluded that polygraph testing's accuracy in distinguished actual or potential security violators from innocent test takers is insufficient to justify reliance on. And that's talking about using it for federal screening. And, you know, there's been, who was it, the Rosenbergs? They'd actually passed an initial polygraph? Yeah. Well, probably everybody who's ever sold out secrets passed a polygraph test at some point. Yeah. But probably be, maybe before they they got involved with the with uh, selling out what they knew. Um, yeah. The uh, now that that's a good example, I think, because you know we we see I I've seen countless television programs where some very serious looking guy uh, in a suit uh, asks very serious questions of someone, and the results of the polygraph are taken. As that's done. I mean, that that's we now know the truth about whether this person is lying or or not. Um, now, uh, but but the reality is that you know science has rejected the polygraph as a any kind of reliable source of information. So why is it still yeah. around? Why 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 hasn't it been tossed out? I think because of the intimidation factor. Ah, media, because it, it works as a... Because at least it, it's, the, it's the stick versus the carrot. Uh, yeah. Cops kind of let you know, well, you know, or if you volunteer to take a, a polygraph, that even if you're lying, it's just like if a little kid you know, goes, well, I'll show you what I know. You know. They may be completely guilty, but because they're offering up what they know or they're offering to take some sort of a test to prove innocence, eh, you know, they'll kind of go, well, if they're offering to put themselves through this, you know, well, they must be innocent. Uh, For the federal, I, for the life of me, I cannot understand why they do it. I think even, I think even, I think uh, some of the senators for some of the committees that they're on have to go through polygraph in order to get on there. Okay. But yeah, I would like, I would like to see those. Those must be fun. Yeah. I, I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, don't have a, I don't want to get into this case in particular, but, uh, I know yeah. that the Travis Walton UFO abduction case involved multiple polygraphs and that was considered a very important <laughs> aspect of the case. And every time I hear about that, I'd say, Forget about the polygraphs. They're not. They're not. What? They're not. They're not relevant. Well, that's. Well, that, that's another weakness of them. Is that in? If you think you're telling the truth, you know, if the readings are accurate, if you think you're telling the truth, but what you know to be the truth is wrong, are you lying or? Well, I think if you're recounting false memories, you're not lying. Uh, you're. Right. You're not practicing to deceive. And if polygra- right. And even if they worked. Well, I mean, like if you saw something that, 
you know, somebody did a hoax, you know, a UFO ho- or Bigfoot hoax. We'll do that one because that one's a little easier to pull off. But, you know, some guy runs through the woods in a ghillie suit. Somebody sees it. They think they saw a Bigfoot. They take a polygraph saying that, yes, I saw a Bigfoot. It's going to come across as, you know, if, it, if it's accurate, I've got to throw that little canard out there because I don't think they're always accurate. Mm-hmm. But uh, if the guy thinks he saw a Bigfoot and he testifies, you know, goes through the polygraph saying, I saw a Bigfoot, it's going to come across as him being honest because he's got not necessarily false memories. He's reciting what he thinks, but his own bias has caused him to still see what he wants to see. Right. And uh, now yeah, I remember, I remember that UFO case you're talking about. Yeah. It, it's still people, the guy still goes around the country telling people that he got picked up by a flying saucer. Uh, mm-hmm. that, that, that was in Arizona, so, wasn't it? Yeah, it was in the seventies, I believe. I lived there. Oh, <laughs> growing up, I grew up in the. Okay, white so you were the guy that got picked the up by the flying saucer. <laughs> no, I was like a year old when that happened. No, I was, I was. No, that was seventy-five. That was right before I was born. But I grew up just not that far from him. Hmm. I actually met the guy. Oh, Travis Walton. I thought he was crazy. Yeah, I thought he was crazy when I was five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I grew I grew up in the White Mountains out in Arizona. Oh. <laughs> so when I heard about fire in the sky and they started saying yes, it happened near Sholo, Arizona, I'm like, oh hell, I know where that's at. Wait a minute. <laughs> okay. Uh so anything more about polygraphs so we don't move on to something else? Um uh, my my background knowledge on polygraphs isn't that strong. I mean, I've always known that they're not reliable. They're not accurate. Uh, and the talk, the talk that uh, Mr. Mashkey gave what George Mashkey was pretty interesting, especially with his own experiences with a polygraph. Hmm. And unfortunately the results of the trial, which uh, the guy, he pled guilty on the second day. And they were actually going after him for um, mail fraud, uh, wire fraud, mail fraud. That's what they nailed him on, which yeah. is still a federal offense. But, right. uh, but yeah, the, the results are kind of before any evidence was really trotted out or anything like that. He changed his plea to guilty. <clears throat> so, like I said, my my area of knowledge tends to be more towards you know the cryptids and alternative medicine, faith healing, that sort of thing. Well, speaking of alternative medicine, Michael, why don't you give us one of your favorite uh, (laughs) examples from dentistry? All right. Well, um, in dentistry, there are, there is this alt dent out there, which you don't hear much about, but there are what they call, they call themselves biological dentists, which make me think they think regular dentists work on robots (laughs) <laughs> and um, the, the biggest thing is when you get a root canal with them. If, I don't know if you've ever had a root canal. No. Um, they were, you know, they drill down to a tooth to remove the nerve tissue. And um, a dent, a regular dentist, they use a material called gutta percha, which is a latex from a tree sap. It's actually, well, it's a natural remedy, but it's actually like a medically inert. It's you know doesn't react with your body at all or anything else like that. And it's one of those all natural things that we kind of sneer at that we normally sneer at, but it actually works in dentistry. But the biological alt dent people um, use a material called Sargenti paste, which is a chemical that they mix up themselves and they inject into the, the areas of your tooth where the nerve tissue was. And if they do it carefully, it's all right, but if it ruptures into the surrounding tissues, the stuff turns into formaldehyde. Yeah. Yeah. Trigger warning to everyone afraid of dentists now. Um, <laughs> yeah. Good well, night. Yeah. And there's been a number of cases of people who have had serious injuries and you know lost part of their jaw or something like that after being treated by one of these people. Um, 
And it's actually like really, it's really easy. I mean, if someone refers to himself as a biological dentist, you know, they're probably going to use this. Um, and it, the couple of times I've had root canals done in the past, I've had different doctors doing it and always look at the eye and say, you are using gutta percha, right? <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, they, they, it kind of also establishes me as someone who knows what he's talking about. <laughs> so they, they, they do it right. But yeah, it's, um, there are not many, but there's enough of them out there that there's been people who have been armed by this. Biological dentists. Yes. Right. Okay. You're right. Okay. And this is. I a, thought my this, dentist was a bit robotic, but. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a technique that is not taught in dental schools, and it's actually not approved. And if it gets out that someone's doing it, it you know, there's probably going to be hell to pay with. Now, are these folk, these folks, uh, are they uh, credentialed dentists? Some of them are, um, and they pick up the stuff on the side. And so there, get, is there a school that teaches this, or online um, box no tops? School, no legit American school teaches it that I know of. Um, I think maybe this is something they're getting through those naturopathic schools, or 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 whatever. Yeah, I, know there's, I know there's naturopath and holistic and homeopathic. Schools. Yeah. I think we've got one here in Oklahoma. Yeah, there and there is so, um, os, there there are a couple of osteopathic schools that have um, dental departments. But as far as I can tell, those dental departments are actually legit. So um, yeah, I'll, but, gi I'll give an osteopath a bit of a pass, a little yeah. bit of a pass. Yeah, because bones are real. Bones are real. So yeah. <laughs> Well, that's something I've never understood. Why? Why are there osteopaths? I mean, why don't why don't you just go to medical school if you want to be a doctor? They're they're short. They're a little bit short. Uh, like you do have some chiropractors, and that's another that fits in with our topic tonight. Our chiropractors. Um, they're. Chiropract some chiropractors will claim that they're an osteopathic chiropractor, which means they went to an osteopath school for, oh, I think it's like a year, to learn the structure and the function of the bones. And then they'll still pop your neck and cripple you, but uh, <laughs> sorry to any chiropractors out there listening, but seriously, uh, as a matter of fact, on my news feed today, there was another uh, girl who was, no, there was another child who was uh, crippled by a chiropractor. But yeah, I've never understood the difference between. I've never understood why. What exactly an osteopath does? I know it's almost similar to um, phrenology. You know, reading yeah. the shape of the skull, and you know, you have this bump here. You're a serial killer. You know, no, that's just where the axe hit me. Um, <laughs> but I, I know it's kind of similar to that. Yeah. And I think it's actually developed out of the phrenology craze of the 1800s. Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe we need to get uh, an expert in on, on that. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I, uh, can... I still don't understand, um, you know, why there is even, I mean, a DO or, you know, doctor of osteopathy. And I think they can yeah. prescribe some medicines uh, and perform. I think they do actually have some basic medical training. Uh on top of just the on top of just the bone structure and everything like that, I think they do have some basic, like RN level training. Right. Oh no, I know, I know an osteopath. I'll see if I can get him in touch. <laughs> well, there, I know was, a lot of interesting. there have been cases too of some you know out there dentists actually trying things like craniosacral therapy and some kind of you know kind of. Mixing chiropractic in with their dentistry, which is horrifying. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. I'm there to get a filling. You have a supplication in the fifth vertebrae. Let me fix your tooth. <laughs> yeah, they're going to pop the seventh vertebrae in order to pop, get the wisdom tooth to quit hurting. <laughs> Ow. No, I, I can't. No, you got to stop. I can't deal with this. Uh, <laughs> My, I, I, my I mean, that scene from Brazil is too bad, for, too much for me. <laughs> oh. 
And I, I used to get sent to a chiropractor two to three times a week by, uh, when I was playing football oh. by my parents. And I, I've got a slight twitch about anybody touching my back to begin with. You know, I, I tend to swing. Uh, doesn't go well with chiropractor. Oh, yeah. I never could understand why my parents were sending me to a guy like my shoulder got hurt. And he said it was because my back wasn't aligned. I'm like, the shoulder is very no, it's somebody injured your shoulder. <laughs> um, well, the other guy was the one laid out flat, not me. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, I was sitting there and I'm talking to the chiropractor going, but I do know a little bit of anatomy. Shoulder connects to, you know, clavicle, shoulder blade, which in turn muscles and tendons and a couple connecting bones connected to the back. Yeah. I almost started singing that song. <laughs> but uh, I'm like, how does popping my back fix my shoulder? I know what's wrong with the shoulder. It's dislocated. You know, and he's, I never could figure it out. It just drove me nuts. And to use chiropractic to help with the root canal. That is just, <laughs> I can't even make a mental image of that one. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm sure there's been all kinds of things like acupuncture as well, but no, I, not a mental image I want. <laughs> um, <laughs> now I, researching it, if you yeah, on a my on a milder uh, note, uh, I did once have a dentist in the '90s, um, for the most part performed ordinary pr dental procedures, but he insisted that I buy this expensive bottle of herbal stuff to rinse my mouth with and it had all kinds of herbs in it uh, and yeah. i had never seen a dentist do that and he said no you gotta you gotta use this you gotta use this every time right after you brush and it's like a 30 dollar bottle you know of stuff that tastes kind of like listerine but has <laughs> has herbs in it it's a naturopath route and yeah. uh, i never could figure out if that was you know if if that was legit or not because no other dentist has ever asked me to do that well, now there are um, dentists saying that you should um, rinse with a fluoride rinse after you brush, like ACT. Yeah. Um, I got that from a cariologist who's a dental specialist who's, who does um, studies plaque and tooth decay. Mm -hmm. And it's a, actually, it's a really good to, um, when you brush your teeth, instead of rinsing with water, rinse with a fluoride rinse. But um, as far as something herbal, <laughs> If it had fluoride in it, it probably would have been fine. But I don't know about all the herbs, though. Well, uh, my insurance company dropped him. I, I'm not sure why, but because uh, <laughs> uh, for the most part, he just performed ordinary dental procedures, you know, like cleaning your teeth. Mm -hmm. But uh, he was uh, this. I mean, it seemed to work out for him that I had to drop thirty five dollars there every time to buy this bottle of stuff. And I needed, uh, you know, I had to, you know, and it lasted about a month, and I had to go get another one. So, uh, work for him. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah he's only putting like a dollar ninety nine of, you know, dried herbs in there. Yeah. Well. Yeah, I I never understood it, but um, also, but I never really researched it either. I never said, well, look, you know, if there's. Let's look at what the American Dental Association has to say about this or anything like that. I just say, well, okay, I pick my battles. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I, I, but I, it did make me a little angry that you know he didn't he didn't offer any evidence that this was going to help me. He just said, oh yeah, it works, it's good. Take my word for it. Uh, even though no other dentist has ever insisted upon using it, so. Um, well, that's people rely on they rely on them being the authority figure and us going oh you're in charge okay i'll do it and yeah and you know, i mean you go to a medical professional you you know you're unless you're a medical professional yourself you don't ever know yeah uh, it, it's hard for non-medical professionals to challenge their doctor you know it's intimidating this person has tons of training and you don't um so it it's, uh, you know, I think it may even be hard for doctors who are not specialists in what they're being diagnosed for. Um, 
Ooh. I'm, I'm sorry. I was looking up herbal mouthwash. Yeah. And yeah, one of the first hits is somebody I kind of made mad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. So, uh, well, she, she wrote a, she had a blog come on about autism and stuff. And sure. I took her blog and I kind of dissected it. <laughs> well, that, that is completely legitimate. Uh, yeah, she can't see you for dissecting her blog. <laughs> yeah. Well, my problem, the problem was like, well, one, my Google searches for like almost a year afterwards came up with some really weird stuff, but, uh, she kind of got upset because I had taken and I put where I got the quote from who the author was. And then I put her evidence versus like the CDC, the AMA, New England Journal of Medicine up against what she had written. Oh, well, that's just not yeah. fair. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to use evidence against your feelings. Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I, as much as we hate to hurt anybody's feelings, I think we shouldn't apologize for that. <laughs> I never did. Don't worry. <laughs> I, thre I threatened to. I threatened to do another one. I, I I do think Phil Plate is right. You should be nice when you when you uh, blow somebody's ideas out of the water. Call but, her stupid. <laughs> I didn't call her stupid. Phil so. Plate. I said her ideas were dumb. I didn't say she was. Yeah, that's right. Attack the idea, not the person. <laughs> that's that's the trick. Um, yeah. yeah. What's the name of the? Oh, you want me to say the name of that speech, Paul? <laughs> of, of that what? Sorry. You, 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 did you remember the name of his speech? D do you remember what his speech was called? Oh yes, uh, it was called "Don't Be a Dick." Don't be a dick. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and you know, basically, you know, attack the idea, not the person. Yeah, yeah it was just really weird. First, that's the first time I think I ever heard him say something that wasn't I mean normally he'll you know he says Help. wasn't G rated. That was the first yeah, that was the first <laughs> time I heard him ever say that. And I'm like, oh okay, good. He, I don't feel so bad about some of the stuff that comes out of my mouth now. <laughs> <laughs> well you're a former bull rider. You're you have a past to say whatever you want. <laughs> oh no 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 I don't no I don't <laughs> legally I don't think I can <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, um, you, you, you've never heard us behind the stalls. Trust me. That's not even really English. In <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm going to take your word on that. Uh, <laughs> I'm, we've never said that this is a family show, by the way. Uh, I've always told people that, yes, you can cuss. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, saying still, don't and don't be a dick is pretty mild, pretty mild on the scale. <laughs> I, I have friends who are shippers. <laughs> <laughs> Out front, everything so mild. Yeah, <laughs> yeah she's occasionally I have a five-year-old pop in here. So. Oh yeah, uh, Colin, right? Yeah, I got finally remembered his yeah. name. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen a few pictures of him lately of, uh, anyway. Um, okay. So are we done with dentistry? Do you want to move, <laughs> hit another dental, uh, bit of woo woo or. Um, I mean, I could go on about tooth whitening, which I think is a big scam, but, um, you know, and that's, but that's, that's not really woo as much as it, as it is kind of just, um, being pushed on us. I mean, we're raised to expect that your teeth are always blindingly white, and the reality is that, you know, your teeth get yellow with time, and that's just natural. Well, we see and, a lot of Photoshop pictures of people with with extremely white teeth. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And, um, yeah. I mean, a, a lucky few can maintain, like, beautiful, bright white smiles all their lives. And then, you know, you have people like me, you know, um, there's actually research to a genetic link between red hair and yellow teeth, um, which would not surprise me. Um, you know, it can depend on if you had certain medications. Um, 
I'm forgetting the name of it. There's an antibiotic that if you're given it before you're eight years old, your adult teeth will come in discolored. Hmm. Um, yeah, I, I can't remember the name of it now. It's, it's dropped right out of my head. And I've known people who've had it, and they've had to, like, you know, get, like, veneers and other things like that um, because they have, like, brown or orange teeth as a result. And But, um, yeah, I mean, the whole industry that is around tooth whitening, you know, all the tooth whitening products and all that, a lot of it doesn't work or it works very slowly. And then if you go into the dentist's office to have it done, it usually only lasts for, like, a month, and then you have to go back. And, of course, that's not covered by insurance. Yeah. So, um, well, if you're, say, uh, uh, somebody who's in front of a camera a lot, that might be valuable then? Yeah, I mean, I, I can see legit reasons. If you're an entertainer, you know, like some of my friends who are performers, they get their teeth whitened fine, you know, it's a professional expense. But for just us regular shows, it's like, yeah, really? Come on. We don't need all that. So, yeah, okay. Um, yeah. I don't think it can hurt you. I mean, there are some of the um, the gels that are used in um, tooth whitening. If they get on the soft tissues, they can harm harm that. You can get burns inside your mouth. Um, they use UV treatments, and that can cause you know UV light. Oh, you know, we all know what UV light does. So um, yeah, it's just not. I don't think it's actually worth it for the. the yeah, well, you know, person. I recently got a crown, and and I. My my dentist uh, said, well, now we're going to match the color of your teeth. Yeah. And they went through a lot of trouble to get the color just right. I thought, wait a minute, shouldn't we get it really white first? And then <laughs> then Matt just put a white one in there? Uh, and, you know, he just uh, he, he, thought, he thought I was joking. <laughs> Don't see a whole lot of white teeth in here, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, dentists actually become a little suspicious if they get an older patient in who has perfect white teeth. Because that's just not natural, right? Um, and some treatments actually work by making your teeth more reflective, which ends up making them look fake. So, I mean, you have white teeth, but they really look like you have dentures. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Well, um, okay. let's move on to some to another topic. Uh, I guess it's my turn. Uh, I'd like to. Uh, the one that I wanted to raise was. Um, the Myers Briggs personality inventory, uh, which is pretty much ubiquitous in the United States. I don't know how much it's used elsewhere, but uh, you go to an HR department and they will train you in Myers Briggs. They will give you a Myers Briggs evaluation. They will tell you that, well, they tell me that I'm an INTP, uh, which uh, I won't go into all the detail, but it, it it's, it's a personality type. And, it can affect hiring. It can affect um, what to, how the, what team they put you on. Uh, it can affect a lot of things, and, and uh, it turns out there's the scientific basis for it is very very dubious at best, and yet virtually probably probably you ask anybody who's been either in corporate America or maybe in a large government agency or a large nonprofit. And they've had they've gone through the Myers Briggs. I never have. They, they did one for animal for where I work at, which was kind of funny because I'm like, like yeah, we're all belligerent, somewhat antisocial. I mean, how hard is that? CK. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you know the well, it was like mine. I think mine came back with saying I was a religious person too. <laughs> well, uh, somebody that, somebody recently pointed out to me it's it's kind of like horoscopes. <laughs> uh, the the, the, re yeah. the reason this thing works is that you just tell a person, oh, this, you're this kind of personality <laughs> type, and they they read the description and they say, yeah, that's me. But uh, this is called the Forer effect. You can you can read a description to somebody and lot and if you write if you craft the description well, a lot of people will think it applies to them. Uh, yeah. There's a very there's a there's a video where uh, a couple of videos online you can find. I'll, I'll put a link to in the show notes where um, a couple of famous magicians pull off this demonstration. They 
they they give a lot of people exactly the same horoscope. After going through a lot of theater, convincing them that they're about to all get an individualized reading, they get the same, and then they all open their horoscope and they are asked to read it and tell how closely they think it applies to them. And the majority, the vast majority of people in the room, like seventy percent, think it does apply to them. And then they're asked to change to change horoscopes and see if at random with somebody else in the room and see if it. It apply, if if the other one applies to them, and it's just, and they read it, and they in ten seconds, and they realize it's the same one. Everybody in the room got the same horoscope. Uh, was that, well, was that Banachek? Uh, no, that? Uh, James Randi did that uh, in his show back a number of years ago, and uh, Darren. Br- yeah, I remember him. Darren Brown also did it. Hmm. Okay, yeah, it's basically a form of cold reading. It, kind of cold reading. Uh, yeah, I mean, cold reading involves statements that almost anybody will will accept as applying to them, right? Uh, yeah, it's kind of like, do you have a relative whose name starts with a letter? <laughs> nope, they all start with numbers, sorry. sorry. Uh, <laughs> My family name's in binary. <laughs> <laughs> My brother, three Stephen... <laughs> the uh yeah the um but anyways uh here in the u.s and i think also i'm not sure about the rest of the world but uh we see the myers-briggs types a lot and hr types in particular think this is really important man it, I've been to management training courses where they say they give you the inventory and then uh, you're supposed to understand how you can form teams out of people with these different personality types. And it's bogus. It, it there's The scientific basis for it is poor. It was based on Carl Jung's ideas, but Carl Jung never really thought that much about his person. He never thought his personality types were that uh, that good. He, he didn't think they were a comprehensive scientific theory. He said, well, it's just kind of based on my okay. clinical experience and it helps me kind of categorize things, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a good scientific theory. Um, but the Briggs, uh, it's a mother-daughter team, they, they, uh, they took up Carl Jung's types and very quickly became, uh, developed this extremely successful big hit from you know, inventory from from it and now uh it's big business it's given all over all over the country um at one of my pet peeves of of pseudoscience that's in the mainstream and um the uh it's kind it's kind of like the polygraph in that it's given in a very serious way everybody it's it looks like science you know, it's a, you, you sit down and fill out this inventory and, and it's scored in a numerical way and it all looks very sciencey, but it's not science. And uh, yeah, I hadn't even thought of a personality test. That's a pretty good one, Paul. The, uh, now, there are other personality tests and personality inventories that are um, thought to be better. Uh, the, it's not... Uh, clear to me as a, as a uh, lay person, why we need personality types, um, perhaps for some forensic purpose or something. But, uh, I would, I would really be worried about being, uh, roped in to a personality type. And I think that a lot of the HR departments will tell you, well, you know, here's the, here's the personality type you have, but <laughs> it doesn't really mean that much. And, <laughs> You can still be any, any, you know, work in any position in the company. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, it's not that predictive and it's not that, it doesn't, it's not complete. And uh, so uh, now, James, you mentioned, uh, let's, let's move on from that unless you guys have more to say about Myers-Briggs. Uh, I'll have some links to the show notes in the show notes uh, that uh, were provided to me by Jita Jaising. Actually, I'm, I'm probably butchering her name. Jita Jaisingani, I think is the way to say it, but uh, with respect to Myers-Briggs and uh, what's wrong with it. And uh, 
you know, why we should get rid of it and not use it anymore. Um, the, uh, we, you wanted to talk a little bit about um, what looked for a brief period back, I guess, many years ago as legitimate science as a paper published in The Lancet and turned out to be anything but that uh, which, and sparked the anti-vaccine movement. <laughs> you want to you give us that story? Well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that it started the anti-vaccine move it, movement because that actually happened back with Jenner and the uh, polio vaccine. Or not the polio, but the smallpox. Oh, okay. Even back then, people were against vaccinations. Um, the deal with, uh, and I like the fact that I don't have to call him doctor anymore. Doc- I wish people could see the air quote. Study. Um on children and I'm sorry, uh, James, we lost you for a second there. Can you repeat that last bit about doctor somebody? Oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, can you pay, hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, but Andrew Wakefield had done a study that supposedly showed a link between autism and the MMR vaccination. But what happened was uh, it was probably one of the more flawed studies I've ever heard of. Maybe a dozen kids involved, and he knew everybody. He knew their history. This was not this was not even remotely blinded. He knew everything about these kids. Uh, published this result, which got snagged up by popular media. Uh, what? was never really mentioned in any of the news reports is the fact that he was marketing his own MMR vaccination. Hmm. He developed his own and he was trying to sell it. So um, it took, I think this was back in the early 2000s, late 90s when he did this study. Um, And it's taken this long for people to realize that, you know, this was a flawed study. It's been recanted. It's been pulled, but you'll never hear, you know, that coming from the mainstream media. You know, it's, it shows up on, you know, some of the skeptical podcasts. It shows up on some of the more science heavy TV shows, but your local channel, you know, ABC affiliate, CBS, you know, they're not going to run a story on this paper being, uh, recanted. Right. Uh, right. Unfortunately, it had a. Uh, and personally, I feel that that man should be held responsible for every vaccine preventable disease that someone has died, or everyone who has died from a vaccine preventable disease. I really do think he should be held responsible. Yes. Well. Um. They. Uh, the and the problem with it is like you'll hear a lot of people talking about autism is caused by the thimerosal in uh, MMR vaccinations. The thing is, you know, you would figure, okay, if that's the case, then you should see rates of autism decrease if they pulled out the thimerosal, right? Of course. But they pulled it in the 90s. Hmm. Now the, the, you know, you know, Wakefield's paper came out in 98, I believe. So, Yeah, I was trying to look it up. And, and it was retracted yeah, a couple he, of years uh, ago by the Lancet. Yeah, see, it took almost, took over a decade. It took like 12 years to pull, to, for it to be retracted, for it to be redacted. And just the fact it's redacted doesn't mean that it's removed. Well, it's just like it's kind of saying, "Oops, this was a mistake." Well, the Lancet themselves retracted it. And, uh, you know, they're a fairly prestigious yeah. medical journal. Um, yes. The, prior to that, um, I think all of his co-authors had retracted. So. Yeah. Uh, but still, the fact that he was still pushing it. Yeah. Now he's still kind of the darling of of the anti-vax movement. Goes around giving speeches. Yeah. Yeah, and he. Um, He's had his license pulled both in England and here. 
you cannot practice medicine anywhere basically uh let me pull this up yeah unfortunately the way you know with the research i do when i pull up andrew wakefield i get a bunch of stuff from natural news which that guy's fun and i think he's the one who put me recently on the anti-vaxxer anti-anti-vaxxer list oh um oh, you're, you're you're on the uh on the blacklist huh <laughs> yeah but i take it as a point of pride yeah <laughs> um let me see yeah i'm just going off of wikipedia which yes i know what everybody thinks of wikipedia but it's still it's more it's as reliable as an encyclopedia to be honest uh oh bugger yeah i'm still learning how to use my hooks so uh mmr controversy controversy yeah yeah there's so much info here it'd take me forever just to skim it but basically he did a bad study with no blinding no controls he and now this is how to how not to science this is the definition of it no blinding no controls he knew the results he was going for and all you know, skewed everything in the favor of his data, which I'm not saying that doesn't happen in more legitimate studies that a personal bias steps in. But he also had, you know, basically financial stake in it. Hmm. And he just skewed everything. And then he still says, you know, that MMR vaccination, you know, the MMR vaccination because of thimerosal, which for people who don't know what that is, that is a form of, I believe, ethyl mercury, which is not able to be taken up by the body in any way, shape, or form. The next time the kid urinates, it comes out. It's not like, I mean, honestly, you get more mercury, more formaldehyde, from eating a pear than you do from any series of vaccinations. Speaking of the formaldehyde, but um, <laughs> yeah, formaldehyde is going to be a common topic in medical stuff, medical woo. But uh, you uh, like I said, my I've I grew up and I actually caught the measles. My parents did not believe in vaccinations. I would not want any kid to go through that. And I've recently found out that, you know, you can actually have secondary effects of it 20, 30 years down the road. Oh, dear. I didn't, I didn't know that. Huh. Uh, you know, mo mo you'll hear a lot of the anti-vaxxers say that, oh, no one dies from the measles. That was one of the deadliest diseases oh, yeah. 200 years ago. You know, mumps, that can be dangerous. Rubella, you know, these are these are serious, dangerous diseases that if that disease in and of itself doesn't kill you, secondary conditions will kill you. Um, you'll also see a lot of an the anti-vax crowd go, well, gee, if you look at this chart of, you know, hand-picked data, it shows that Polio was already on its way out. Measles was on its way out. This was on its way out. What they're kind of neglecting to look at is the fact that, you know, prior to the 1920s, sanitation in hospitals was pretty much non-existent. You'd be lucky if a doctor washed hands. You know, with the advent of better sterilization techniques, better sanitation techniques, better and more dependable water. You know, because everybody would, before that was drinking out of the same cistern, which if a dead rat fell into there, everybody's catching something. Um, once they started increasing the levels of sanitation, yeah, the occurrences of disease did start to drop off. I'm, I will not deny that fact. But the fact that we had vaccinations and we were able to promote and increase community immunity that's what helped wipe out some diseases i mean even in livestock they've gotten they've annihilated completely gotten rid of one disease and in 
people. It's uh, polio is nearly completely under control. Measles was almost wiped out in this country. It just cropped up every once in a while. You know, if you if you don't vaccine, if you don't keep the level of vaccination up, the level of immunity up. These diseases are going to come roaring back, and we will not have any kind of a defense against them. And starting with people who are immunocompromised, people who are actually allergic to the vaccination, you know, the eggs or something in the vaccination to begin with, or in the very young, the very old, those are going to be the people that are going to get hit right. first. Well, you talk. This is a. Yeah. I was going to say this is a whack, misguided. Okay, you're about to lose your G rating. <laughs> this is a wax bullshit, dumbass idea that should not be propagated. And the people who seriously promote it honestly need to be tried as war criminals. I mean, this is a war on humanity, really. <laughs> okay, tell us what you really think now, James. <laughs> yeah. These motherfuckers. Okay, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, 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 I found, you know, when I was a kid, uh, you know, you would talk to like your grandparents or, um, and they would tell you about the horrors of polio. Oh yeah. Uh, how it, long. it was every parent's nightmare was their kid was going to get polio. And yeah. it, if it didn't cripple it your didn't, kid, it, it could kill him. It the kid. Yeah. Well, if it didn't, and not just that, but the entire family, I mean, that house would be locked down. Oh, yeah. My mom would be quarantined in that house. My mom used to put to that told me, uh, yeah, the entire family had to be quarantined and everything else. I was listening to something else about it recently and talked to my mom about it. And she said, yeah, they, there's someone she knows who still walks with a limp to this day after they, they came out of polio, but they're limping forever more. And people who were paralyzed or whatever. So, yeah. Well, there were people oh. who, who died from polio. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. it, it was a very, very serious disease. And Jonas Salk's vaccine wiped it out, uh, out of, off North America. Yeah. And it, I think where it does crop up now, it's mostly in Africa where there's a strong anti-vax sentiments or anti what And India still has it endemic. It's native. It's just there are populations in India that it will still crop up from time to time. Hmm. But you know, and I don't know if it's environmental or what over there. I think it has something to do with um, not having clean water. Um, I think it's similar to typhoid in that way. But um, And I think they, they were saying that it's actually a disease that a lot of people can catch, but most people fight it off. You don't even realize it. Oh, it's like 10% are susceptible to it. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I was listening to the same thing you were. <laughs> um, salt phones? Uh, yep. <laughs> Sorry to promote another podcast, Paul. Oh, oh um, you can promote it whatever you want. <laughs> Part of the deal. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe, maybe they'll give us a little bit of that uh, max fun money. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, if I was in this for the money, I would have quit long ago. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But no, that, that, I mean, if people are interested in polio, they actually do a really good job on that show of describing yeah. everything about polio. It's an excellent show. Yeah. Um. yeah but between, between polio and measles uh, and the other diseases that pre, in the pre vaccination era, there was, uh, you know, smallpox, uh, there were a lot of child deaths that oh, yeah. are now simply not there anymore. Um, and it was really very, very frightening to be a parent in those days. Um, that is something that modern parents have totally lost touch with. Is you know, they, they think of these diseases as something you come through and they've forgotten, you know, they need to talk to their parents and their grandparents and, and realize that kids died from this stuff. You know, and they don't think about it. I've, I've had discussions with anti-vax parents and like, oh, it's just measles. I'm like, just measles? Are you crazy? Measles has all these horrendous side effects. You know, I mean, your kid might pull through and he might be, you know, he might die. And he might be left, I think, measles can, can leave you blind, um, I, I believe. Yep. Um, and other things blind like Blind and 
30 years later, you can develop, uh, I think, encephalitis. Yep. And yes, I'm at risk for that. <laughs> leave you deaf um, and things like that. And they just think of these as, you know, oh, the kid's in bed for a few days and then he's fine. No. <laughs> that That's only because of the sanitation, the food, the nutrition, the medical assistant. Because even if you're anti-vaxxer, if your kid is sick, you're still going to at least do something to alleviate the pain, which can cause a lot of the problems mm -hmm. in measles polio. Yeah. Well, in the early 1960s when I was a kid, uh, there was – I got measles, mumps, and um, – and uh, what was the other one? Oh, small uh, chicken pox. Chicken pox. I had chicken pox. Uh, now, no. chicken pox is now, yeah. is now uh, there's now a vaccine for that. And all kids get it. Uh, the um, What that leads to later in life is, of course, shingles, which is terrible. Particularly. That's, I'm, I'm wary of that because my mom says that I, she had never seen a case of chicken pox as bad as mine. But I even had <laughs> And it's mm. And I turned 50 this year, and I need to talk to my doctor about, you know, getting. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, please, yeah, I do. you know, I'm really <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. are you, uh, they say you're supposed to get your shingles vaccine when you're 60, and it does reduce your risk, and it also uh, makes your symptoms less severe if you do get it. Yeah. Um, I have friends younger than me who've had shingles attacks, so yeah, I feel like I'm a ticking time bomb. <laughs> <laughs> well, my father I mean, had it. And it was really, it was really bad. So, and it, it may have de contributed to his the decline of his health that ultimately led to his yeah. death. So, um, oh. yeah, I've personally never known. I've never seen shingles, which, considering everything else I've dealt with, that's kind of shocking now that I think about it. But I, I've, I've seen people with mumps. I've had measles. You know. Uh, I've never seen shingles. Yeah, well, I uh, hope you don't. In fact, with uh, the, the new vaccines, there should be a lot less shingles in the future. Uh, but we're going to yeah. have to wait another 20, 30 years for it to really work its way out of the population. Yeah, I think my wife's about to go get, because she's never had chicken pox. I think she's about to go get, after the baby's born, I think she's going to go get uh, meet the chicken pox vaccine. And I think my son just got it his last checkup mm -hmm. yeah they you know, they get a lot more than we than i used to i, de I never got mumps or or measles or <laughs> uh we got we got german measles the rubella uh we got that mm -hmm. um yeah and I, I was supposed to have gotten all that but when i actually got my shot record i found out it was all written in my mother's handwriting oh my gosh so i could go to school <laughs> oh oh <laughs> Oh. Yeah, it's kind of like kind of like that old saying, you know, what doesn't kill me better run or no, makes me stronger. <laughs> uh, yeah, or, or gives you shingles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Which, yeah, there there is that. I've got enough. I got arthritis at thirty eight. So, oh my gosh, jeez. <laughs> yeah. By the way, don't let your kids play football without pads, and do not let them ride bulls drunk. <laughs> That was my public service announcement. Yeah. Well, my kid is pretty anti-athletic, so he's 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 just he's inalterably opposed to playing sports. So uh, I just played sports so I could hit people. Honestly, <laughs> I could hit people and not get thrown out of school. I told him that. I said, "You play football, you get to you get to knock people around." He goes, "Yeah, but they'll knock me around, yeah. so it's not worth it." <laughs> so yeah. Well, my thing was I was I was a football player that carried his you know biology book or science book in his gear bag i was a science nerd even back you know i would i loved science loved history and stuff so when i wasn't on the field i was reading those books it was kind of wasn't the best football player <laughs> yeah well I, hit, I just like hitting people the books have served you later in life the uh <laughs> football probably didn't it, no yeah maybe increase your I threshold of pain that's that about one. it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, I do have a high threshold. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, um, we're coming around up to where we're getting close to being wrap it up. Um, I'll. Uh, any, is there any other topic you want to cover before we before I give my little uh, sermon at the end? I'm good. 
I was going to say the the topic today of science based or no, let me rephrase that. So pseudoscience based common day items. I mean, that's a huge area. We didn't touch on homeopathy, which I I know a homeopathic vet that actually worked where I was. Homeopathic vet. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was that was an interesting woman. We had a few I would like to call them discussions, but I don't like to lie. <laughs> um, but uh <laughs> you know, but I mean you've got homeopathy, you've got the whole and if you ever listen to Mark Chrislip, who writes for Science Based Medicine, if you have a piece of pen and paper, write this down because it's a fun little trick. Supplements, complementary alternative medicine. Write down the first letters, you have scam. <laughs> um, but, uh, I mean, the whole thing of, you know, supplemental, medi- you know, supplements, vitamins, if you eat, right. if you live in America, odds are you don't need vitam- vitamins, you don't need any kind of nutritional supplements. Plus some of them, if you're on say warfarin, you know, saw palmetto can be dangerous. Um, but supplements, homeopathy, just there's such a, it's such a huge range. You could almost do a second spin off on just that stuff. Well, yeah, we can, <laughs> uh, supplements are a big deal in a very big industry. Uh, I, mm-hmm. All you have to do is go to, you can go to any store, really, and you'll see a whole shelf of all yeah. kinds of supplements. Unregulated in industry, when you, you know, when the news is hitting recently that, you know, some supplements contain none of what they're supposed to contain. Yeah, they've got like powdered peanuts in there, which is really good for the people with food allergies. <laughs> More sense. You know, like me, my, my sister-in-law is highly allergic to peanuts. Mm. I mean, she is deathly allergic. You know, some of those supplements did have powdered peanuts in there. If she had taken one, it would have killed her. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I, I am allergic to cinnamon, and that, you know, cinnamon bark was found in a few of them. You know, I, I would not fare well if I had taken one of those. Oh, you know, and then they don't ever say, if you read the backs of the supplements... They never say, give you any kind of uh, indication of drug interactions. Like I said, saw palmetto is one of the more well-known, just off the top of my head, it's one of the more well-known ones. It It interferes with a lot of other medications. I'm sorry, Mike, I couldn't hear you. It's natural, you know. It's like, yeah, of course. Yeah. Asbestos is natural. Uranium is natural. Enjoy the soup. I mean, Snake venom is natural. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. Just because it's natural doesn't mean it's not going to kill. A meteor falling on your head is a natural occurrence. The universe is going to kill us, you know. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> You're talking about the nat the natural the naturalistic fallacy. The natural fallacy. Yeah. Yeah. One that that is a pet peeve of mine, and even dealing with animals, we I hear that one a lot. And we had a woman who came in, told us that, oh, I don't know why my dog is bleeding and the skin is, the dog had mange is what it was. Looked yeah. like a chupacabra. Um, oh, really? No, we, oh, that's a whole nother thing. We actually had a paranormal group come in and try to pull a mange dog out of a kennel because they thought it was a chupacabra. I almost let him because this thing was mean. <laughs> I almost let him do it, but I'm like, no, I, I need to be nice. You just say, hey, go, but, we got the uh, chupacabra section down at the other end of the. <laughs> I've got a picture I sent Blake Smith of one of them that looked just like a chupacabra. <laughs> but um, they, uh, but yeah, I had a woman come in. Dog had severe mange. I mean, it had less hair than Charlie, Charlie Brown. Oh, poor thing. And. The woman was telling me that she took it to, or she was telling other people up at the shelter, well, I go to a homeopathic doctor who has been giving it and starts rattling the stuff off. They had no idea what she was talking about. Somebody goes, go get James. He deals with it. (laughs) Well, they knew what homeopath meant, but they didn't know. And I'm talking to the woman, and I'm like, okay, so have you been doing it? No, she's given me tincture of dog bane. And lavender oil 
in this, I'm like, have you taken it to an actual vet, someone who <laughs> didn't send in box tops and actually go to school? What? Well, no. I'm like, you didn't go to a vet. No. Okay, we're running, and yeah, I filed. We filed cruelty charges on her because that was inhumane what she was doing to that animal. But she thought that the bad thing is the truly bad thing is she thought she was helping. Oh yeah. Because she was going to a homeopath and using natural medications on her animals. I mean, it's like this whole kick right now of. Yeah, and by the way, just for the those who are just now tuning in, I do tend to go off on tangents. Um, That's okay. But, tangents so are fine. Thing about, we, we don't discourage yeah, tangents. The whole thing about the, <laughs> <laughs> but the whole thing, the whole kick, you know, that's come up recently about your dog is a wolf. It needs to eat meat. Okay, that's nowhere near accurate. That's not, that is, okay, yes, dogs are predators. They're not like cats and obligate predators. Cats have to eat meat in order to, you know, survive. Dogs have evolved. The, the first, the first dog. What they've been finding recently is that the first dogs that cohabitated with humans, I wouldn't. I'm not. I wouldn't say were tamed, but they were living in the same area. They were the nicer ones, and it turns out that there is a link between temperament and the ability to process grain. The nicer dogs, the nicer canids, were the ones that were able to eat from, you know, the midden heaps, the compost heaps, the scraps that were left on the ground in the hunter-gatherer cultures and the first agrarian cultures. They could, these animals could eat our leftovers. You know, the more aggressive wolves, the more territorial, the more fearful of humans, they were closer to being obligate. You know, but if you ever watch a wolf in nature, yeah, they do occasionally eat grass. They do occasionally eat bits of vegetation for sustenance. Uh, that's one of the reasons why if you look at your dog food bag, you know, you see cornmeal, you see a bunch of grain in the ingredients. If you want to see what uh, James, I think we've lost you again. Oh dear! I think the chupacabra got him. Did did I fuzz out again? Yeah, or? you did. Yeah. Okay. Uh, depending You're on back. Where I left You're back. Depending it's on where good. I fuzzed out. Okay. I don't know where I left off at because I got off on a rant and just didn't even pay attention. Okay. Well, you're allowed one <laughs> rant per episode. Uh, I think you've had two. Okay. So. I think. I think that's my third, but I'm making up for last time because. You can have mine. Yeah, when I'm, when I'm <laughs> okay, Michael. Michael uh, has uh, donated his rant to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, you got to figure when I'm dealing with a rocket scientist and I'm dealing with an astronaut educator, a soft, I'm the dumb kid in the room. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you certainly know more about animals than I do. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, you haven't met my family. Yeah. But anyway. Um, <laughs> you know what, what? Another time, uh, James, we're going to have to talk about fun things like cryptids and and uh, um, <laughs> chemtrails, and oh, we'll have to those. get Mike Bowler on. I, uh, uh, ooh, yeah, I, 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 I would love, I would love to have Mike. Mike and I, I think, would just have so much fun with that one. Yeah, because <laughs> we both kind of that's both kind of in our ballywick right there. Yeah, and there and there's uh the one that. There's some that are kind of borderline. Um, one one that I thought about, I might talk about, but I'll save for later would be the uh, recovered memory therapy or uh, uh, hypnotic regression. <laughs> oh, I, or, I love that one. Yeah, I don't. I do. I I do not love it. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, I just love it in the fact that it's it's such bs yeah I, I don't like the damage it's caused to people you know i mean that that stuff has destroyed lives oh yes uh but, quite a few uh, but on the other hand the people that promote it i can guarantee you at some, somewhere on their person they either have an ankh <laughs> you know the egyptian cross they have a crystal 
or they have a tattoo of a butterfly somewhere on their body. Well, that's a testable <laughs> hypothesis. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm married. I don't think my wife would like me testing that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you know what? I'm, we're gonna I'm gonna kind of um, wrap it up here. We've been talking for over an, over an hour. Uh, okay, <laughs> and uh, I want to thank uh, my two panelists tonight: uh, James Garrison of the Oklahoma Skeptics and Michael Cornett. And uh, Michael, I might see you at a future drinking skeptically. Uh, the uh, I, I don't live in that area. I live in Baltimore now, uh, so it's not, a little hard for me to get down there. Uh, well, I don't get there. I've, I live in Silver Spring. I don't get there very often. But <laughs> <laughs> I come down to visit every once in a yeah. while. But, oh, J.D. is yeah. a good guy. Uh, I, I love talking to yeah. J.D., so. Uh, I love J.D., yeah. Um, well, if you guys are ever out in my way, let me know. Yeah. <laughs> and which I don't know why anybody comes to Oklahoma. Um, this was actually a stop. This was a stop over to visit family before we went to Australia when I was ten. <laughs> anyway, so some, somehow I think there's a black hole somewhere in the state. You just get sucked in. <laughs> I've been to Oklahoma. You know, one thing that, that Oklahoma has a lot of is uh, severe weather and uh, rednecks. Oh. <laughs> So, and my son is is a big is a big uh, fan of severe weather. So we might get out there for some storm chasing sometime. Uh, <laughs> in all in all in all honesty, on that, be very careful. Oh yeah, we uh, we would definitely work with the, professionals. Uh, yeah, well, one of the professionals, the one that has that armored car that drops to the ground, I think that thing got flipped. Oh, did it? Oh, well, the what's his name? Sean Casey is that? I, I think so. One of the two of them, because there were the two. Well, it was Reed Timmer. Reed, Reed Timmer has the Dominator. It, it drops to the ground, and uh, that that I think that may have been it. it. Had the bubble on top so he could film. No, the guy with the had the bubble because he was trying to catch three sixty. That, yeah, that's Sean Casey. He does IMAX films of. Uh, yeah, I, th- I think his, I think his vehicle got flipped. Oh, really? Well, one one of those two vehicles. I cannot remember off the top of my head, but it got hit. Right. Well, there was another guy who, who was who was killed, and that was uh, Tim Samaras, a professional storm chaser. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And he was a— Here, here are tornadoes. Yeah. Cut a six-foot trench, you know, 20 feet wide and rip out wellheads. Yeah. Well, they had some incredible footage of, of a tornado knocking over power, you know, high, high-tension power towers, just bending them mm-hmm. like they were made of rubber. Amazing. Just hold them over. Yeah, uh, yeah. They, we get some really extreme weather. Around. More seems to be the epicenter for most of it. Mm-hmm. I live I live west of Oklahoma City, where the you remember was it last year where the monster tornado dropped in at? It's like the world's biggest tornado. Yeah, yeah. Mile that landed about a half mile from my house. Wow. Hopefully. Oh hopefully that's where i live <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah <laughs> yeah well, uh well yeah, so you know i would like yeah. to see that from a distance <laughs> but a pretty far it distance it was very impressive yeah getting stuck in the middle of it was even more impressive yeah i was on the road when that thing hit wow so, yeah luckily i think i caught it when it was waning so but yeah if you guys are ever out my way let me know, and you know, if nothing else, I'll get the Oklahoma skeptics together, and we'll do a bar crawl. Great, <laughs> <laughs> I'm in. Uh, okay, well, all good. right, uh, I'll hold you to it. Yeah, now I'd just like to uh, let the audience know uh, a couple of things before I we sign off tonight. Um, there are some. The, right now, uh, we've been holding this uh, recording session at uh, nine o'clock Eastern time. Uh, in the United States, but we have a number of people in the panel pool from Europe and elsewhere. So right now the plan is episode 13, which is July 3rd will be in the early afternoon here in, on the East coast of the United States, which puts it in the evening in Europe. So hopefully our European panelists uh, will get a chance to, to join that one. Uh, if that works out well, we'll do it again. And uh, episode 15 will be late at night here. It'll be more like midnight or so. Uh, and 
uh, that will the help of that will accommodate um, folks in uh, South Central Asia as well as uh, Australia. Wow. So, uh, okay. So that that right now is episode fifteen, which will be um, July seventeenth. So, I'm hoping that uh, we'll get a good turnout for that those two as well. Uh, right now, when we say open participation, we mean open participation. You don't have to be in the U.S. Uh, to, to participate. And uh, the um, another thing is that episode 10, uh, which is next week's episode, does not have a very big panel yet. Uh, I'm hoping that um, more of you will show up for that. So if you'd like to be on the panel for episode 10 and you haven't been on before, um, send me an email at unseenpodcast at gmail.com and I will sign you up and get you on there. That's next week. Uh, so that's the 12th of, of, uh, June, 2015. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, you think we got something wrong. You think we got something right. Uh, you want to rant a bit yourself. Blame Paul. <laughs> Blame me, <laughs> and uh, yes. Well, we want to hear from you. I am. I am not held responsible for what I said. Uh, uh. We'd certainly like to hear from you. Uh, you can email unseenpodcast at gmail dot com. You can come to our blog, which is unseenpodcast dot com, and uh, there will be show notes for this episode, episode nine, and there will be links there that you that. We'll establish things like uh, the Wakefield paper. Um, pretty much everything we talked about should should have some linkage, and uh, just and also bios of our panel and and pictures of our panels in case you want to see what good looking people we are. And the uh, <laughs> the uh, come there and comment. Uh, you can also join our Google Plus community, and we also have a subreddit. Um, so uh, now some of you may be thinking, what about the Wow Signal podcast? It's been kind of on hiatus lately. And yes, it has. Uh, we have a small amount of material we want to put out. We need to get more. Um, I was going to do an interview this week, but unfortunately I found out uh, that I had the wrong date for my daughter's eighth grade graduation, which turned out to be the same time as the interview. So I'm going to reschedule that. I should have something out very soon. Uh, we're making a big push on the SETI front there in the WOW signal, uh, as well as some other topics that are of interest, uh, astrobiology. I'm hoping to have some special guests here on the Unseen Podcast soon. I uh, can't really state who and when yet because they're not signed up, but when they are, I'll let you know who they are. So this has been episode nine of the Unseed Podcast. It's the 5th of June, 2015. And this is your host, Paul Carr. And I'd like to once again to thank Michael Cornett and James Garrison. Please come and visit thank us you, at... Paul. Thank you, James. And please thank come and visit both. us at unseenpodcast.com. Good night. Good night. Hi, guys. Woo! <laughs> that was fun. That was fun. Yep. Uh, I promise next time I have a better. I'll, I-